Grüß Gott, moin moin, guten Tag, good morning, uh, I'm doing my best to do as many German uh, uh, welcomes as possible. Um, so, uh, welcome to this, we have uh, 40 minutes and uh, I really would like this to be as interactive as possible, so if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand, I'll try and keep an, uh, an eye out or just shout out or whatever, um, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Bursell. I am the uh, Executive Director of the Confidential Computing Consortium, uh, but I'm a techie by background, and so happy to uh, go in that direction if people would like. So, um, first of all, who knows what confidential computing is? Okay, that's more than half, that's a start. Uh, how many of you actually used confidential computing? And that's higher than usual. So that, I'll take that as a start. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, so this is uh, what I plan to talk about. Uh, and less people have lots of more interesting things they want to discuss, um, this is what I'll stick to. Um, and uh, <clears throat> first, I want to sort of place confidential computing in a broader picture of, of what it is. And it's part of a family of technologies, generally called privacy or privacy enhancing technologies, which are about protecting your data whilst it's in use. Um, and confidential computing does more than that, absolutely. But this is partly, you know, people realizing that we've been doing encryption of data uh, on the wire, sort of on the network for ages, data in transit. We've been doing encryption of data at rest in storage and databases for ages as well. But when it's in RAM, uh, you've got a problem in that it needs protecting. So uh, confidential computing is one of uh, these sets of uh, technologies. So what is it? Luckily, uh, I've got a definition, and this is from the Confidential Computer Consortium. We uh, took about six months to come up with this definition, uh, bar one word, and then we added another word, and that took us another three months. So that's about nine months of work, give or take. And it is the protection of data in use by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment. So I'm going to sort of deep dive into so what some of those uh, words mean. Uh, the ones in, uh, which are in co different color are particularly important, and we will definitely be uh, coming back to that. Uh, so let's kind of look at the problem to start with. In the standard virtualization model, which is what everything does on the cloud, give or take, right? Um, this is kind of how I think of the world. You've got a host, which is the sort of big box with the red dotted line around it. And uh, then you've got a couple of workloads. Uh, and let's say the workload we care about is the one on the left, which is this sort of yellowy, greeny thing. Uh, and then there's another workload from, that owns by somebody else. And we've also got the host operating system and all, all the gubbins, all the other stuff that takes, you know, that happens on the host and is, uh, is part of the host. So that's hypervisor and, and, you know, libraries and all those other bits and pieces. So in a standard virtualization model, um, there are, we can protect quite easily against two types of uh, problem. We can provide isolation between work, the two workloads, right? We can do workload from workload isolation quite well. This is <clears throat> first sort of came up to address the, what's called the noisy neighbor problem, where you had a uh, one workload from one tenant was misbehaving, maybe using too much resources, trying to attack uh, another workload. <clears throat> and we know how to do this. VMs, containers do a great job of this. Um, also, we're quite good at host from workload isolation. That's really important because you don't want uh, a workload attacking the host, you know, getting into the OS, getting to the hypervisor, doing bad stuff. Because once you've done that, it's owned and everything uh, is off. The problem is, uh, is, is type three isolation, which is uh, protecting the workload from the host. Okay. So basically, the way that virtualization works is that whoever owns the host, the hypervisor, the kernel, or has supervisor access, admin access on that machine, can do whatever they want. They can look at all the memory pages of all the applications and all the workloads on that machine. And that's not always what you want. So what confidential computing does is it uses trusted execution environments to protect the workload from the host and from other workloads as well. 
And what a TE is, is a set of memory pages which have been uh, protected, isolated from the rest of the machine, uh, and it's based on CPUs. I'll come back to that in a minute. But basically, it's a hardware-based, a chip-based set of instructions, which means that even the kernel can't look into that set of, um, uh, of, of, of memory pages. And it basically uh, protects both the confidentiality and the integrity of your workloads. Exactly how it does that depends somewhat on the silicon architecture. And we have now a number of different sil silicon architectures that support it. So uh, uh, Intel has two different versions uh, of confidential computing. One is called uh, SGX. The other is called TDX. AMD has one, which is called SEV SNP. ARM has one called CCA Realms. And RISC-V also has one called Sanctum. NVIDIA has one. And that's why, if you look on the page now, it says not just CPUs, but also GPUs. And this is really important for things like uh, AI, which we'll come to in a bit. So before I, before I move on, any questions on this? Does this make some sort of sense? Can you see why you'd want to do this? Because you don't necessarily trust your, uh, the person who owns that machine. Azure, AWS, Google, OVH, uh, whoever it may be who's providing your cloud services. You might even not trust people internally. You might be doing this uh, to protect against insider threats in your organization. Cool. I'll, I'll carry on. So we've, we've got a bit of a problem, though, right? So let's say uh, I, uh, I say I want to create uh, one of these TEs, one of these trust execution environments, uh, and I want to put a workload into it. Uh, and I go to my, uh, my CSP, and I say, create one. And they say, yep, here's one. I've created it for you. And I say, wait, wait a sec. I don't trust you. Because the whole reason I'm doing this is because I don't trust you. How can I trust you when you tell me you've created one of these things, right? We've got a bit of a problem here. Uh, and so I can't be sure that it's really on the, the hardware I think it should be on, that it's correctly set up, that it has the software in it that I want, uh, or, in fact, even that it's unique. Uh, they could just be pointing at multiple versions of the same thing. And without a solution to this problem, I can't really go very far. And so in order to address this, we have a technique called remote attestation. So uh, I'll explain this, and then uh, again, I'll wait and see if we, anyone has any questions. So we've got the, our box on the, uh, on the left again. And uh, the blue thing is the TE instance, right? And so what I've got is that I've got an application in there. And there's a number of ways we could do this, but let's, let's take it this way. I've put an application in there, OK? So for now, I'm trusting my CSP. But I, so I've not put all, anything sensitive in it at the moment. I've just put my application, which, let's say, is open source and everyone knows. And I then have the application ask the CPU, which is hosting it, to perform a measurement. And by perform a measurement, I mean do hashes, cryptographic hashes, of all of those memory pages that make up the TE and everything in it. OK? And the CPU does this, because this is part of the uh, capabilities that make up confidential computing. It then signs that measurement using, again, cryptographically, using keys which are specific to that chip. And it sends it, that measurement, to an attestation service. And this attestation service is trusted by me, the user, to tell me whether things have been done right whether the cryptographic uh, measurement is correct, whether the signature looks good, whether the hash is what I expect, given what should be in uh, the TE. And assuming that I get a good result from the attestation service, that means that I know a number of very useful and important things. The first thing is I know that the TE is operating on valid hardware. It is hardware that supports it, and it's given me a, 
a measurement, and I'm happy to use it. It also tells me it's been correctly set up and initiated, and also that the software in it is what I think should be in it, because I know, or the attestation service knows, uh, what the hash should look like. It's got a bunch of known good values. And based on that, we know whether or not it is what it should be. So any questions on this? This is a really, really important uh, thing that's going on here. Please. Okay, so a new tenant wants to come and, and create a new workload, right? So, well, first of all, the attestation service is going to need to know what that workload should look like in this model, right? Uh, so you need to give them the hashes and, and, and tell it what it looks like, right? And so the tenant will then ask the CSP to, to create a TE and to put an application in it, okay? And then that, it will need to tell the attestation service to expect a uh, measurement, right? So there's a number of ways of doing this, and I have oversimplified slightly. But basically, the attestation service needs to talk to or get a measurement from the CPU, which is on, on the host, uh, and then will give a yes or no answer to whether it looks good or not. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah, sure. How did you solve the issue that now we have that attestation, the user is happy, but how does he know that when he's now connecting to the workload, it's the workload that he has attested? So uh, the question was, we're now happy that the user knows that the uh, the work the that it's been set up correctly, but how can the user know that the, uh, the workload it's going to connect to is actually the one it should be connecting to? And there's a number of good ways to do that, um, uh, one of which is very simple, which is that the, uh, that attestation measurement is also available to the workload. So you can connect to it and ask the workload. There's also some very clever uh, things like uh, a version of TLS which actually uses the, all of the information we've just gathered to create a, a TLS uh, t a tunnel connection so that we, we're actually using that to do that. So it's RAT TLS is a particular implementation of that. So the answer to that is that the information about the attestation is actually available within the application itself. So I can be sure that the one I'm connecting to is, uh, is that as well. Um, oh, I should have said right at the beginning that on Thursday we have a mini summit, a Thursday afternoon, I think it's just $10, um, on confidential computing uh, based here as well. So if you're around on Thursday afternoon and you're interested in learning more, uh, please, please come along. Any other questions on, uh, on this bit at the moment? No? Okay. So um, just a brief recap. First, I've explained these available on, on both CPUs and also GPUs, and that actually are available from lots of other places as well. Now, although originally uh, the confidential computing was aimed more at laptops, over the last sort of eight, ten years, it's been uh, coming into server grade uh, computing, and pretty much every single uh, CSP, certainly all the large CSPs and hyperscalers have this available right now for you to use. And you can buy just server grade hardware, Xeon chips, I think all new Xeon chips have this capability in them, in them uh, to do this yourself. So this is widely available. You can just go to your CSP and say, I want to do this. Setting it up, take some doing. And that's something we're working on. And of course, there's open source projects. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but it's there and it's usable right now. So the next thing I wanted to talk about a bit was uh, some use cases and, and how, how this makes sense and what you can do with this stuff. But first of all, let's talk about uh, the primitives. We've got basically two things that we care about that are going to allow us to build use cases and to do new things with these security capabilities. And these primitives are this hardware-based TE and remote attestation. 
And the hardware is important. I won't go into this in, in detail, but it's just, if you're a security person, um, one of the key things about security is you need to have a root of trust, and you really want to have that in hardware, because otherwise it's possible for whoever owns that machine to be messing with it. So uh, the, hard, the fact that the TE is hardware-based is very important. And we have this remote attestation piece as well. And this gives us four properties that we can use when we're thinking about building a system, when we're thinking about the capabilities uh, that, we're, uh, that we want to be putting into an application or a, or a larger system. The first one is integrity. So this means that once I've measured the, uh, for the attestation, I can be sure that things are what they are, and that they cannot be changed. Uh, the integrity of the, those uh, uh, memory pages, so the data and, in fact, the application are, cannot be changed from the outside. So the integrity of my application and its data are protected. So the host can't change them, other uh, applications or workloads on the host can't change them either. The confidentiality is also assured for the data. So um, because we know that we're not going to put any data into it until we've done the attestation, we can be sure that the confidentiality of, uh, of that data is also assured. Now, we can't be sure of the confidentiality of the application because in the model we just used for the attestation, we transferred that into the TE, and it was only after, the, after that it was transferred that the measurement was taken. So we can't be sure that someone didn't look at it first. But if we take a model where we actually load the important pieces, the, uh, the sensitive pieces of our application, after we've done that initial attestation, and we know that, for instance, we've got a bootloader that will accept that, then we can build a system which gives us uh, confidentiality assurances around the code as well. So the other two things that this allows us to do is have separate uh, and unique identities, because each time we do an attestation, we get a separate identity for each one. The measurement will give us a different signature, uh, and we can do add things like nonces and things if we wish as well, but we can have a different identity for every single trusted execution environment instance. And that means that even if you have you know, two different T instances with the same application on the same machine, using the same cores on the same chip, they can have different identities which is very important when you're looking to do anything to do with security and authentication and being sure that what you're connected to is what you think. Uh, and uh, identity and uniqueness as well. They, we, I've just discussed both of those in, in that. Does this make sense? All of these are a sensible and useful properties. Another question, please. Fantastic question, yes. Where is the root of trust? And the root of trust, uh, physical root of trust, is absolutely in the GPU or the CPU. Now, of course, um, you also have a variety of other trust relationships. You have a trust relationship with the, uh, with the uh, uh, attestation service. You need to trust them. And uh, you're going to need to have trust in Intel or AMD or NVIDIA or whoever created that chip because... They're the one who are providing the, all of these pieces that fit together, right? But you have to trust something to execute your code, right? There's always something you've got to trust because you can't actually execute without that. Um, homomorphic encryption gives you some options, but when it comes down to it, you need to trust something, and that needs to be your chip vendor. So uh, that is, that, that's where that root of trust comes in, okay? Any other questions? <clears throat> Right. So, what are the things that we can gather? What, what can we do with these assurances? Well, we can be sure what's running. We can be sure that the application that we think is running is the one that we want it to be running. 
we can be sure, uh, can we answer the question, can it have changed? The answer is we can be, can be sure that it hasn't because we have the integrity. We can be sure also that no one can see inside it. No one can actually look at this. We have the confidentiality. I can be sure that the one I'm talking to is the one that I want to be talking to because we have this identity. And could it be spoofed? We can be sure of that because of the uniqueness assurance as well. So these are a set of properties and assurances that we can think about when we're building an application. If you ever need a, a combination of these uh, things in a system you're building, well, this is one way about going about it. It's all very well to say I've got integrity protection. That's great. But how does that actually relate to what you're building? And this is what I want to start talking about now. So this is just a, a set of you know, different sectors or use cases where you might want to use confidential computing. And we absolutely have use cases in all of these. The problem that I've always run into when people say, you know, what's the best place to use confidential computing is that once you start thinking about the use cases, it's difficult to think of a sector where it's not relevant. Okay. So uh, one of my favorite uh, examples of this is I was at the RSA conference uh, earlier this year and running a birds of a feather session and anyone could come along. And a gentleman came along and I said, where are you from? And he was from a large Californian statewide pest control company. And it was a, what, pest control? If you're a business and you have a pest problem, do you want everyone else knowing about that? No. If, you, if your house has a cockroach problem, do you want all of you, everyone know? Of course you don't, let alone things like, you know, credit card details and, and you know, personal things like that. So, you know, if pest control company uh, can find a, a use for these technologies, then I think pretty much everybody can. But I want to talk about, uh, just briefly go into three uh, examples uh, of this. Has anyone here heard of Gen AI? It's a fairly new thing. It's not Going up, yeah, okay. No, you haven't. I'll, I'll let other people explain it to you later on because I really don't have the time. Okay, so it turns out that Gen AI is, is getting quite a lot of money and attention at the moment. And uh, I was at a, a very large multinational bank a few months ago in the city of London, and they were saying, we would love to use lots of AI, Gen AI, and we can't. We just can't. And the reasons are, there's loads of sensitive data that we're using here, right? Both in the training data, because we're putting lots of you know, customer information, risk information, and proprietary stuff in there, but also in the inference, where we're actually, you know, we want to make sure that when we ask the questions and we get the answers back, not only can no one see that, but they also can't see the, 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 the clever stuff that's doing it in the This is hugely important information about whether we buy someone for $20 billion, right? This is not stuff that you can just put out there. And we can't afford to run all of this stuff in-house because it eats, um, you know, compute cycles like nobody's business, and we don't know when we're going to need it. We can't just have lots of huge, expensive machines being, you know, running, doing nothing for, you know, 90% of their time, and then need twice that number three times, uh, you know, a, a month. On the other hand, we can't put it in the cloud because we can. I mean, however much we love Microsoft Azure and AWS, and, and we just can't trust them with that sort of level of sensitive data. Partly, I guess, because they might be buying those sorts of people or buying their competitors, right? And so, being able to run the training and the inference uh, engines inside confidential computing makes a huge amount of sense for that sort of use case. It also allows you to do some kind of interesting stuff where let's say that I, I create my, my, my training uh, data and I put loads of data in it, but I also track that data. I put uh, some information as I do that in, into that. Well, as I move that to the 
create a, an inference engine, I can sign that with the information in the attestation uh, measurement, right? And say, actually, when I'm, when I'm getting the inference answers, I can prove that it came from this set of data from this initial training data. So I can actually use it for provenance uh, back into the previous information that came in. And that can be hugely useful. Um, but you know, if you're, again, if you, you want to be doing, deciding who to buy uh, for $20 billion, knowing that this is data that actually did come from your firm rather than from a competitor's firm is kind of a useful thing to be able to do. So uh, that's uh, one use case. Uh, any questions about the Gen AI sort of use case set? No? OK, good. Um, so here's another really interesting uh, one, which I, I personally love. So um, there are lots of folks uh, in doing financial uh, things where actually they need to be able to uh, cooperate with each other despite the fact they don't trust each other. Right? So things like uh, there are interbank transfers all the time. Right? Um, and at the end of the day, working day, they do reconciliation service. Um, and there may be you know, 50 banks all putting data in. And someone's got to run that service, right? Someone's got to run that. Who do you trust to do that? Do you take turns? Do you just say, oh, I trust Santander, they'll always be trustworthy, or you know, I trust Chase Manhattan? Nah, it's horrible, right? So one of the things you can do with confidential computing and attestation is say, OK, I'm going to uh, write uh, an application which will do the reconciliation. OK? And I'm going to share that application with all of the banks. And they'll all check it, and they'll all agree it's fine. It's not going to do anything it shouldn't do. OK? Right. So I'm now going to load that application, which you've all seen, and you've all taken the hash off, right? Cryptographic hash, so you know that's what it is, into a confidential computing environment, into a TE. And I'm going to get an attestation measurement. Aha. Uh -huh. And we get then to the question from Nicholas here. How do, I, how do I know that I'm talking to the thing I'm talking to? Well, because I've got that attestation measurement. And that means that as long as each of these different banks is certain that they are connecting to the application they thought they were connecting to, which is one they checked and they took the cryptographic hash off at the beginning, they can now have a trust relationship. They can trust that to do what they think it should be doing. And this can be used for a whole bunch of different things. So uh, maybe a pharmaceutical research company wants lots of customer data, data from uh, hospitals. So they go to the hospital, give me all of your, uh, your patient data. And the hospital says, I don't think so, because once it's gone, it's gone, right? But if the pharmaceutical company can write an application and show that it'll only ever look at these bits of data uh, from the patients, you know, whether they've got diabetes, how old they are, uh, their sex, and I know, their income, um, and well, uh, just give a yes or a no, an X or a Y, or a, a percentage range, and we'll never exfiltrate the rest of that data, then as long as they, the, the pharmaceutical company can prove to the hospitals that they are putting their data into that version of that application, then suddenly it becomes a different, uh, different thing. I was speaking to someone who worked with the UN. And the UN is always coming up with policies, right, on different things. Um, and that means that they have to get policy ideas from lots of different countries. But the different countries don't want to share you know, their particular views on what I know, percentage points they should be doing on mining or, or climate change. They want to put it all together and then you know, extract a, a mean value, for instance, right? And this is a way you can do that without exposing all of this data and without having to use some, you know, fairly technical and awkward, uh, sometimes uh, complex tools like differential privacy or homomorphic encryption. Although you absolutely can combine those tools with confidential computing. There's no reason not to. 
The thing about confidential computing is you're just running a standard application. You're not having to do anything weird and wacky with the data. You're not having to do anything uh, you know, in terms of uh, how you uh, encode things. Yes, you need to make sure that the application knows about the environment it's in, but you, you can use standard computing uh, models and languages, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to leave a few questions, uh, time for questions, uh, a little bit of time for questions at the end, but I've got one, one last one, which is Web3. Remember Web3? Kind of went away a bit, but it's coming back. And the idea here is that you, you're decentralizing uh, some of uh, the functions that we use every day. And that means taking away the control of everything from, uh, I don't know, a Snowflake, or from Facebook, or from AWS, and uh, allowing people to run their own decentralized services, maybe a chat service, maybe a, uh, a reconciliation service, whatever it may be. And in order to do that, you need to decide whether you trust the person to be doing that, right? Because they could just be skimming off your data or taking your money, whatever. And confidential computing, again, allows you to have some strong cryptographic assurances about this because they can prove to you that what you're accessing is what you should be accessing and that they can't uh, change it or look inside it because you've got those properties of integrity, confidentiality, identity, and uniqueness. So just a few examples. Now, this is absolutely being used out there uh, in the real world. Um, what's happening next? Well, we're going to see more and more GPUs. Uh, this is becoming an important thing. We're going to see it everywhere. Microsoft has made it clear that they uh, want, I can't remember the, the time scale, but 90% of all workloads on Azure to be using confidential computing. It's huge. And we're going to see it happening more on the edge, particularly as ARM use cases uh, start happening. Uh, and also, I think we're going to realize that it's not just this confidentiality and the integrity. It's absolutely the attestation pieces that drive business value. Um, so it's widely available. It's, it's pretty fast. Um, it's, you can use existing code, and it works with other PETs. If you're interested in finding out more about this, or you think your company might be, or organization, um, please consider coming along to or joining the Confidential Computing Consortium. Our meet, we're part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and uh, you, which means you can come along to all of our meetings for free. You don't need to be a member. I should never say that, but it is true. Uh, so come along and, and get involved. We, we, we really do enjoy that. Um, and also, if you're a, a startup, um, we have organized 12 months free uh, membership for startups uh, under 100 employees. Although you do need to be a member uh, of, sorry, member of the uh, Linux Foundation to participate. We also have however many, uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13 or so uh, existing projects. I, I can never remember because we always have more joining. We've got another one joining at the moment. Um, which do a variety of things. Some of them are around the TEs themselves, some of them around attestation. Uh, we've got one joining which uh, allows you to, to do some of the stuff with uh, confidential computing and AI. Um, please have a look, uh, get involved. Uh, this is it's all open source, these are all part of the Confidential Computing Consortium. And if you are part of an organization which is doing confidential computing and thinking about open source, we'd love to hear uh, about, about that as well. So I'm going to stop there. We've got uh, about five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you very much indeed for, for listening. And uh, we have the couple of questions we had already. Um, any other questions, please? Sir? So what about uh, performance costs of using confidential computing? Is it for application that have an extremely high CPU? Sure. So what, the question is, what about performance costs for, for using it? That depends uh, quite largely on a number of things. Firstly, which, uh, whether you're using SGX, TDX, a uh, AMDs, all different things. Um, and also on the type of operations you're doing. So p CPU itself isn't a problem. But if you're doing lots of I.O., for instance, that can be a problem because you're uh, having to go in and out of the uh, this CPU context quite a lot. Um, 
generally, 25% would be very bad, and what 2 to 5% hit is, is pretty good. So somewhere in that range. It does depend on what you're doing, and it is possible to write pathologically bad cases, and it's possible to write overly tuned uh, use cases. But compared to something like you know, fully homomorphic encryption, we are talking you know, hundreds of thousands times slower typically. It's, it's near native in terms, uh, in terms of that. So there is a performance hit, yes, that's improving. Uh, and again, if you're doing AI stuff, you want to be putting stuff in a GPU accelerator, obviously, and that is something that's, that's uh, becoming much easier as well. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. So the question is, um, you need to trust the, uh, the CPU vendor quite a lot, and there have been vulnerabilities discovered in, I'm not going to say one particular vendor, but they're in, in different vendors, right? Uh, which means that you need to be sure you're using the most recent version of the, the firmware, the microcode associated with that, and they do rev that fairly often. Uh, and the question was, uh, how can you be sure that the CSP you're, you're using, for instance, is using the most recent version. The answer to that is you can't be sure until you do the attestation. The attestation uh, measurement will tell you which version of the microcode. So you can absolutely check that. So one of the policies you might have uh, in the attestation service is to say, I'll only use the two most recent versions of the microcode from AMD and the most recent from Intel, uh, for instance. That, exactly those things are captured in the attestation measurement. Uh, it's a very important question, yes. Uh, sure, sorry. Uh, so, so maybe I missed a step in the sort of application integrity type of things, but uh, you know, if you're deploying an application, be it a container or at least a guest VM, they typically self-mutate. Linux or Windows gets VM, you're going to self mutate, modify files. Sure. Run, right? So you're making the sort of assumption that what you are here running is an immutable set of containers or whatever. When you do so, so, application integrity. So the question is what are application integrity? Um, and I, I didn't explain things well enough, and that's, that's my bad. So, what I mean is the integrity of the initial image uh, can be assured. If you need to make further uh, uh, assurances around that using something like IMA uh, will help you. Obviously, so you're, you're just doing integrity of that thing. What we're saying is that the integrity is assured from external influences. So external influences can't do it. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that yeah, that's great, great, great uh, question. Sorry, not to have been clear before. Sorry. Um, so the measurement that I get in my attestation token is often dependent uh, upon the um, which hypervisor in the non-secure world in the uh, mm -hmm. So the, the question was, uh, the measurements you get uh, from in the attestation measurement includes information such as the hypervisor that kicked things off. There's, me there's many other bits and pieces, right? Is, this, is the CCC doing anything to standardize that? The answer is that uh, there are a number of things happening, and the CCC is hosting some of those discussions, absolutely. If you're interested in that, we have a uh, special interest group specifically on attestation. You're very welcome to join it. We'd love to see you there. So we have a number of uh, special interest groups uh, on the technical side 
Um, we've got one on uh, governance, risk, and compliance, one on attestation, uh, one on uh, Linux kernel stuff. We've got our general uh, technical advisory council. We've got an outreach and marketing uh, uh, group as well. All of those are uh, available to anyone who wants to come along. And we may well spin off one or more two, uh, one or two more in the next uh, few months. Uh, there's some particular stuff around attestation and terminology and stuff that, uh, that may turn up as well. Uh, very quickly, well, I think probably... So, so the question is, many of these hypervisors are written in C, and most people, well, lots of people don't trust uh, C. Well, the answer to that is you shouldn't have trust your hypervisor. And the hypervisor in the main box is not in the trust, uh, in the trust chain for a hardware-based C, uh, TE. So the hypervisor is out. Everything outside uh, the TE, apart from the CPU and its firmware, is out of the trust uh, chain. Yeah, one last question, yeah. So the question is, uh, are there uh, any projects around reliability? The answer is yes, not all of which are within uh, the CCC. Uh, and there's things like uh, Cocoa's Confidential, confidential con Containers, uh, which is part of the CNCF. That's an open source project. So that's one example. And there are other things going on. If you're interested, come along and find out. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your time and uh, questions. I really appreciate it. If you have any more questions, find me, uh, confidentialcomputing.io as well. Thank you.